manual experimentation and bee eating. We are consequently desensitized to the less socially acceptable forms, or so sociologists, sociologists such as Dr. Clifton T. Flynn argue. Marie A. Strauss, in his cultural spillover theory, expands this idea to the scope of moral agency, arguing that the more one is exposed to culturally acceptable violence, the more likely one is to perpetrate culture, culturally unacceptable violent action. Leah makes a relevant, relevant contribution to this inquiry, probing the notion that maybe the animal abuse done by these young people sounds especially bad because it is framed within a contextualized pattern of abusive, aggressive behavior. Still, the specific acts of animal cruelty themselves might not be especially unusual. Regardless of the contextual induction, the fact remains that animal violence is far more commonplace than is realized or acknowledged. A study conducted by Flynn at a Southeastern University found, found that 49.1% of undergraduates had either witnessed or perpetrated animal abuse. Another reason the unsung plight of animals goes by largely unheard is precisely because it is unsung. In Flynn's words, aside from nonverbal human infants, non-human animals are the only victims of systematic discrimination and exploitation who truly cannot speak on their own behalf. More often than not, our ignorance to their suffering is quite heedlessly yielded. Because of this communication barrier, we often find ourselves at a philosophical stalemate when considering the extent of our duties to animals. In her reconstruction and reconsideration of Kant's conception of duties regarding animals, Laura Dennis encourages us to consider animals as particular sentient beings, not as members of a particular species, nor as part of a teleog teleological system that includes all members of all species, as well as inanimate nature. Under this paradigm, the species barrier is rendered an impasse more crossable concept more palatable. The ethical concerns in providing just treatment toward animals becomes coherent, imminent, and logical. These are beings that we must treat with respect not simply as a means to developing strong moral character, but for the end of their well-being alone. Herzog touches on a poignant truth in pointing out that the awkward fact is that most wanton animal cruelty is not perpetrated by inherently bad kids but by normal children who will eventually grow up to be good citizens. Entering a further level of questioning, he later asks, why do fundamentally pe good people do fundamentally bad things? That this question need be asked at all is a step away from speciesism. To frame animal cruelty as a fundamentally bad thing may seem entirely too simple, but without scaling back our perceived understanding of the consequences our actions may have on ourselves, we are left ignorant to the more immediate fallout which inevitably ensues in the lives of others. Thank you.